Hello everyone. This video we're going to be returning to the world of the Dark Crystal, the 1983 adventure game adaptation of the film of the same name by Sierra Online, one of their batch of early adventure games called High Res Adventures. We're returning to record a debrief episode, which is something I like to do for series where I feel there's still more to show of the game, even after we've completed it, and to uh, talk generally about the elements of the design and the experience of playing the game. This video is going to take the form of uh, two broad parts. The first part where we replay some sections to uh, discover some new elements of the game, or to make some connections between things that we, we didn't before. And in the second, I'll be giving more of my uh, general thoughts and, and impressions of the game. So let's let's get started, because um, a mystic's about to arrive with an important message for Jen. But I think first, Jen ought to dance. Oh no, no time. Here's the mystic. So the mystic is bidding us to uh, to go to the side of our of our dying master Ursu. Although the, the text here doesn't uh, specify that Ursu is our master, doesn't give us a relationship, um, but that information is contained in the, the rather lovely original um, manual for the game. Okay, I've got my uh, my maps open beside me on the screen here. Um, I know we need to go west. We're going to head urgently to Ursu because we are under time pressure here. We get to see these lovely, lovely illustrations again. So, uh, the um, information to uh, to help me discover the the new parts of the game that I hadn't before uh, come from a few different sources, and I'll link those in the description to the video below. Now, here we are with Ursu. Uh, uh, we do need to talk to Ursu uh, to receive our quest. Um, I'm not sure if, um, without doing this, we, we're unaware of of certain things and we can't achieve certain things within the game. Uh, I don't know if that there's a certainty there. But Ursu uh, does give us a, uh, a puzzle before he leaves us. So uh, his puzzle is, what do the Sun Brothers quarrel about? Find the answer to this mystery and present it to Orgra. And this is something we're going to come back to later in this video, so I did want to draw attention to it. Um, with these words, Ursu dies and his lifeless body vanishes from the steep train. Which is um, nicely corollary with the, the way the Apple II uh, redraws a screen. It's a nice meeting of um, narrative effect and technical limitation there. So the, there's a little little new um, element here that we can discover if we look at the bowl. Um, so I, d I hadn't thought to do this before, but um, looking into the bowl, Jen sees the image of a crystal shard. So we get to see what, what we're looking for in our quest, which is, is handy in a way. Although I don't know if there's anything um, to provide a further clue to, to aid us on our quest here. We can try and take the shard, but let's see if that avails us or anything. We can't do that here. It was just an illusion. Um, I do remember in the, the film, I think the shard uh, is conjured in the bowl by Ursula as he's explaining the quest to Jen as they're having that dialogue. So I owe, um, owe this little discovery to uh, Lee Alexander's Lo-Fi Let's Play video. I do recommend um, a series of lo-fi let's play to anybody um, interested in the experience of playing games in in general. Um, she looks at them through a um, a lens of um, personal experience often not often explain often uh, played in childhood um, and reflecting on what that what that meant and the weight of these games and their um, the imaginative space they they take up. Uh, it was one of uh, an episode of one of her low file plays that I've been holding back for myself um, in the knowledge that I, I really do intend to 
intended to play the game, so I wanted to um, wait until I had before before watching it. So here we are at a, a loose uh, loose rock face of shale. So we can get a piece of shale here. It's going to be our main cutting implement. And we need to head back the way we'd come. Back to the ring of standing stones that is pointing north there. It's um, a nice graphic pointer of, um, of where we should be heading. And unfortunately the um, location, dig location is a little more obscure, but here we find a strange looking flute which we also need to get um, to be able to find the correct crystal shard eventually. And we're going to tumble headlong into the the forest, the wilderness full of creatures. I need to make sure I'm looking at the, the right map here on my um, the other side of my screen so I can navigate this area as well. Okay, so we're going to head through um, just the essential things we need to make some progress here. We're going to head north to uh, this beautiful pond and meet this fine creature on its lily pad. Uh, we do need to cut a lily pad free, but hopefully not the one our, our very friendly um, frog-like acquaintance is sitting on. So we, we take that lily pad with us, and then we need to head east to where the, the stream is, the babbling brook. Um, we need to listen to that brook, which was another another thing I had missed until I, um, until I really needed to find out about it in the, the original playthrough. That unlocks a um, secret path for us, which is um, is quite an elegant way of um, expanding progress. Um, I think for a, an adventure game or a game in general of this of this era. Um, here we can also get some pebbles from the the floor of the, the brook, um, and then here is a great place to head further north. There's another location to stop off on. this one here, the Gelfling village. So I hadn't realised um, before because I only thought to try it when um, Kira was with us, uh, that you can uh, sit on the stones um, just by yourself and you still get the, the same images appear on the wall of the, the ruins here. So we can look at the wall and uh, we're told there are some hieroglyphics. We can try and ha have a look at the hieroglyphics and we get more of a description. So included in the hieroglyphics are pictographs of a two-pronged flute, a crystal shard, a female gelfling and a castle. Also among the symbols on the wall is a drawing of a triangle inscribed within a circle. Jen is in some ruins. So I guess on, um, on reflection because of the expected um, uh, manner of, of play for this game, that you will you probably try it and restart it. Um, you'll you'll get stuck and um, and loop back round to the start. This having this available as um, as player knowledge uh, at some point um, sticks with the player, and they can uh, look in previously unexplored areas. Or, or search them in different ways to try and find these elements if they feel they're they're missing them. Um, so it's, it's again, it's another interesting way of seeding information into the the game world and the um, the expected experience of of playing the game. Um, so I I do kind of appreciate it, even though uh, by this point, if you hadn't known you needed the flute. Or where to find it, you you would already have missed it. So that's um, something to I think something to bear in mind when thinking about this this era of um, of adventure games is that um, repetition and replay was um, an expected convention. So we can stand, I believe, to get up from the stones, and then if we yes, if we head north one more time. Um, I need to change my disc, but once I have, will be the location of something else interesting to to discover. So if you followed the um, the let's play that I streamed 
um, you will be familiar with the moss-covered rock. I had speculated quite a lot about um, what was going on here. You can remove the moss if you have the shale, you scrape it away, and then quite clearly we can see that there is a, a spiral on the boulder. But if we have a look at it, um, let's see what it says. There is a spiral carved into the surface of the boulder. Now in the manual, I believe it is, um, there is um, a suggestion that Jen is under the protection of spirals. Uh, it's either Jen as sort of a, a part of the mystics or Jen as a girlfriend is, is under their protection. So I assumed that the spiral was perhaps a place of sanctuary for the um, for Jen to hide, Jen and Kira to hide, um, perhaps when the Gotham or the Crystal Bat were around, but that didn't seem to work in practice. And in fact, there is a different purpose for the spiral. Um, we can try and look at it as an, its own kind of item. So it says Jen glances briefly at the spiral, but then looks away when he fails to notice anything special about it. Uh, so that, to me, um, just indicates that there wasn't anything further to see here. But I think the intention is that um, we need to be looking closely at it to uh, to uncover its secrets. So what can we? How can we phrase it so that we will um, look at this more closely? Can we study the spiral? Um, no. So we get the. Uh, I haven't got a um, response for that, although I do recognise your uh, your verbs and nouns uh, in the form of why in the name of Orga would Jen want to do such a thing? Um, so we get that response there. Um, can we examine the spiral? Uh, no, we get the same text as looking at the spiral. Uh, it seems that uh, examine is a uh, synonym for, for look. Um, in this um, this parser engine, so um, what we need to do, in fact, is stare at the spiral, which is um, not a verb that we use anywhere else for anything else. It's not sort of encouraged that we need to examine things in any further detail in any other location, but that is what we need to do here, and this is the text we receive. When Jen stares at the spiral, he goes into a trance and sees a vision which reveals the answer to Ursu's riddle, Moon Daughter. Which I find interesting for several reasons. Um, I had assumed, uh, because this is what I would do were I making the game, that um, having set up a riddle that seemed to apply to either the history or mythology of this world, I would seed that in a story to be discovered within the world. Um, but what we have here is we just have the answer provided directly to the player, hidden behind a, an unrelated puzzle, which is more uh, syntactical, because you just need to know, interpret correctly what the game is implying with its description of something um, and that you need to uh, rephrase um, your intention in a particular way um, and once you do that um, almost arbitrarily you get the answer to a riddle um, to which this is is almost entirely unconnected other than an association between I believe the mystics and spirals as iconography um, which Yes, again, is is part of the um, the manual's backstory, um, but is not is not brought up in the game. Um, so that's very interesting. Also interesting is that the answer given here is Moon Daughter singular, um, but everywhere else um, I find the answer it is uh, Moon Daughter Moon Daughters plural. Um, so I will um, go back to. Orgra and see if Moon Daughter is also an accepted variation of the answer. And if it's not, I, I might take issue with that. Uh, but this is a, I, how did I find out about this particular general information? Well, that was uh, from decoding uh, one of the clues in Wits Notes, which was a very useful document I found in um, 
randomly on the internet while searching for help with the game. Um, so it's contemporaneous with the, the game's release itself. Um, Wits End Publishers put out a series, a series of hint books um, which were written in a, a simple cipher um, that were still hard to um, casually scan and find the answers for. So I decoded uh, the answer to what is the answer to Ursu's riddle. Um, and the, unfortunately, the first two uh, the first two lines of the solution gave the um, rather misogynistic suggestion of uh, what would men quarrel about? Women, of course. Um, but then moved on to talk about the moss-covered rock, which piece piqued my interest. Um, and I thought, well, I, I'm not sure what to do. Um, and then the uh, penultimate. Um, hint there is stare into the spiral so I just I tried tried typing stare spiral although it seemed an unusual verb to use and um, and this is what happened so yes it, it paid off um, I will put the link to the wits notes um, PDF scan uh, in the video description as well so you can have a look at that for yourself um, it's an interesting document um, and a uh, a good way of um, citing how um, how people responded to the game at the time as well. Um, so next I want to head um, east. Um, yes, that's fine. So in the Podling village, which is another, another very fine image, um, and I want to head south. Uh, I'll need to change my disk again. But that's no problem. So we need to pick up a little, a little something here. So I want to see if this works. So we've been lucky so far not to have encountered a crystal bat. I hope our luck holds out because I want to get this sling. So I think I don't know if this is true every time because there does seem to be some element of randomization to the game but if I have a look at the sling I think that will trigger the appearance of a crystal bar. The sling, a weapon for hurling small rocks, appears to have been made by Gelfling Hand. Um, I do like that how that description um, implies something quite significant about the narrative if you, um, if you know a little bit about uh, the backstory. Um, I didn't. No, so sometimes it does. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to carry on south um, because we can head now head onto the path to get to the swamp. And the next time we encounter a crystal bat, I will show you what I want to show you about that. Here we are. So uh, we do find a crystal bat once we get to the far side of the swamp. I don't think it puts us in immediate danger in the same way as when we're in the forest. This Gartham I don't think will appear after a couple of screens here. I think this crystal bat does stay here as well but hopefully it gives me the opportunity to show something off. Now there is a another um, hint in Wits Notes there's a question, a question before the hints that says, how do I get rid of the crystal bat? Um, which I was very keen to read because that crystal bat is something that had, had plagued me across most of the game um, before it finally disappeared when we got to the castle. So I, I will read you the, um, the hints in order as I decoded them. So A, it won't kill you. B, you really don't need to do anything, which I don't, I, ha I take objection with that point, because if you don't do something about them when you're in the forest, Gartham will appear after uh, a couple of screens, and you're unlikely to be able to escape them. You have to reload the game. Um, so if there is something to be done, it would be nice to know what it is. So the hints continue. C, have you found the sling? Uh, yes, I have. D. Look in the brook for stones. Uh, they, are, they are pebbles, um, which I think is important. Although maybe um, they are synonymous with, uh, with stones in the, the past, so that's possible. 
And then E is just the unhelpful uh, hint of use this. So I had to work out the the um, the idiom myself, but you can, uh, which also surprised me, use the noun as a verb, which I thought was something the parser probably didn't like, uh, like staring. Uh, but you can sling pebbles. Oh, the bat is gone. At what? So at that point we would say, at bat, and it would work. But the bat is gone. So we shall ignore the crystal bat, and we shall head north. And then um, I need to look at my swamp map just to make sure I head to the right place. We need to go to the vines. Okay, so we're once again wrapped in the vines. And we'll call for help. We will look around. We'll cut the vines. We, we, we have a moral objection to it, unfortunately. Can we struggle? Pretend it's not a struggle. Can we um, writhe? Can we seethe quietly? No. Can we um, go north? Oh, we can't, but luckily Augur is here. So let's look at Walgris Hand. It's a great entrance. It's a great entrance in cinema, and it's a, it's a great entrance in the game, too. Let's talk to Walgris some more. Do I know the answer to the riddle? Yes, I do. Is it Moon Daughter? Yes, it is. So Moon Daughters works as well, but the answer given by the game and accepted by the game is Moon Daughter. So here we are, having once again been rescued by Kira and Fizzgig. Um, and there, yeah, there's some bits I can uh, show you from this point. So um, there's a giant beetle shell here. I think we need to turn it over to use it as a boat. That's right. Um, and there's a small pouch that, pouch that's been exposed, so we can take the pouch. Oh no, take the pouch. Um, and, uh, as we did before, if we have a look at the pouch, if I remember to put the O in. There you go. All it says is the pouch is closed, so we do need to open the pouch. Um, it's quite exacting as to as to what we need to do to see its contents um, and then if we have a look at the pouch we see I'm not sure why I'm incapable of pressing uh, at the moment uh, we see the pouch is full of smoke seeds so I did find out whilst throwing everything and anything at a locked gate later in the game that you can throw the seeds and um, it explodes in a dense cloud of smoke which is interesting to note so we will go in the boat here, um, sorry, we'll go in the shell, which we want to use as a makeshift boat. We'll head down the river and um, head back to the Podling village for a party. Now unfortunately a crystal bat is here, um, so we can try and sling pebbles, but the bat is gone. Bat. Before Jen can act, the bat flies away. Okay, um, we'll have a look at the village. Everything seems to be fine. But then we have a, a fearful clattering sound. Before before us looms a Garfim, one of the menacing beetle like warriors who serve the Skeksis. And we're in uh, this situation again. So it occurred to me. Um, playing through again for to see if some of the things worked before recording for this episode that actually what I could use is, is throw the the seed now we know it's there our pouch is open 
um, to make um, some cover smoke to, to escape. And indeed, that seems to be what it's intended for, because you get this whole whole other screen appear. So when the smoke seed hits the ground, it explodes in a dense cloud of smoke, allowing Jen and Kira to make good their escape. So that seems to work every time, whereas um, it seemed to be a random chance of whether we would escape just by entering a uh, run. It seemed to work sometimes, but not others. So we're in this um, very interestingly placed narrative screen where we do have to loop back through the podling oh, pod, through the podling village to see its destruction. Um, it's a really interesting way, way of um, using geography to force uh, a certain amount of order on events, on narrative events. Really interesting. Ah, so here I've hopefully got lucky and can show you how we take out the crystal bat. Uh, one has appeared after I've obtained both the pebbles and the sling, so I should be able to type in sling pebbles. I'll be asked at what? I'll say at the bat. And then using the sling, Jen hurls a pebble at the crystal bat, killing it instantly. Jen is in the forest. And thereby freeing up the screen from those pesky crystal bats and the threat of a Gotham attack. So very useful indeed. Now we are able to free ourselves of the presence of crystal bats at will. It's an excellent time to take another couple of tours through the screens comprising the forest and swamp areas. First uh, as Jen alone and then as Jen accompanied by Kira and Fizzgig to uh, have a look at the difference differences between them and how skillfully they've been composed to evoke a feeling in both situations. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. I want to start off summarising my thoughts on the game by talking about it as an adaptation. I find it a curious thing to think about in terms of adaptation, because but fundamentally I think it works well and it shares the plot of the film and conveys a lot of similar things, um, but I also think that as a piece of game design, I think it hasn't deviated at all from what Roberta Williams and Sierra were doing previously in their, their previous high-res adventures. It's an amusing thought to me that this could be based on a film just as easily as Mystery House or Wisdom of the Princess could, but I, I think that's a little disingenuous. I think the core thing to take away from the undeviating design philosophy of these games is that whoever decided to give Sierra the, the job of making an adventure game adaptation of The Dark Crystal found a really good fit in what they were already doing. The only real innovation of any kind, and it's, I, I hesitate to call it that really, is having the um, player character appear on screen at all times, although just as static as any other visual element. And Jen here is important in perhaps a way exceeding his role in the film. Um, because the game, unlike the film, can't unfold at a um, predetermined pace, it is, um, it is driven to some extent by the player's actions, although um, follows a fairly strictly linear sequence. The primacy of the individual player's experience and um, thereby uh, Jen's individual passage through this world forces that strand to the forefront of the game, whereas it's um, more closely interwoven with the other strands of the story in the film. And the, the key point to come to here is what we're experiencing by looking at these screens side by side, especially Jen's alone to start with, is um, the sense of solitude that there is within the game. And this is why I think Sierra's default um, style at this at this point in time 
is a is an excellent fit because there there is that sense of solitude built into the base mechanics of these adventure games. There's um there's a loneliness in Mystery House and Wizard of the Princess of someone wandering around this um this unpopulated world, exploring, interacting with items, but excluded in some ways, um, isolated from uh, from it. So that is that is um, built very much into the player experience um, by by means of how we mechanically interact with the game. The scarcity, but you might even say the paucity of interaction, even it reinforces that isolation. Um, and the excellent thing that this game does is it expresses that visually in these screens and then when we need to revisit them um, but Jen is accompanied by other friendly characters then um, they seem a lot more friendly the, the world doesn't seem as removed uh, things are more interconnected and that's a, a great piece of visual design and visual planning I don't know how intentional it was that, that those two sequences be followed um, and it be implemented that the screens be exactly the same but uh, with the addition of Kira and Fizzgig. Because that makes a, that has its own um, visual language that compounds the actions that we're, we're taking and any written text as well. So it's, it's quite a sophisticated, I even go so far as to say eloquent, uh, visual expression of, of this set of ideas. So there's this um, really quite powerful sense of solitude in the beginning of the game, um, which then uh, transfers into companionship in the, the second part of the game, um, after Jen has discovered Kira. Um, but then when Jen and Kira are separated again towards the conclusion of the game, that um, that sense of isolation and is, uh, things are more dangerous at that point in the story. Uh, a sense of uh, fear as well, I think, is, is quite well conveyed in the narrative. Um, it, um, it plays on those emotional connections um, and an emotional experience in the world in a way that are, I haven't experienced uh, the previous Sierra Adventure games tackle. It works well to convey a, um, an emotional character story at the same time as also wrapping up the ideas of um, the story of a fractured world, uh, its pieces coming together and healing as, as very much the, the story of the Dark Crystal is um, and, and this game echoes. It's just that the global world experience is more at the forefront in the film I'd say and it's definitely more in the background in the game. I think the game does a good job of conveying a living world and it doesn't really have that much to work with. It's got um, it's got those six colours to paint with in light. But I don't think we can say it uses sound to enhance the experience. The only sounds are those uh, those system noises when uh, text overflows and you need to hit return to, to get the second portion, which uh, I think is jarring if anything. And it has no use of animation, um, it can redraw the screen, which is um, another distancing technique um, that kind of increases the sense of, of isolation, because nothing is perceptibly moving, it's changing state. But I think where it does succeed is that because it is largely enforcing a linear progression throughout the game. It can direct its graphics, it's, it's um, a f I think fundamental resource for, for a sense of place and character. It can direct those to certain atmospheres, so it chooses, chooses different palettes for different areas, different geographical regions. It is quite good at distinguishing the geographical features of those areas and changing the quality of lighting in them. The fact that you can uh, look at the suns converging and um, as you get to different parts of the game the the suns are getting closer and closer. That's really good at giving a sense of uh, time progression and world movement although it's not uh, observable in the moment. Um, you can 
come to it in sort of discrete slides of time. The fact that there are lots of visible creatures on the screen and um, the relatively rich evocation of the senses in the text as well. And I say relatively in respect to, um, to previous games uh, from Sierra. This isn't beating out anybody's um, text adventure, but it's, um, it's doing its own thing. And that's probably as good a point as any to talk about the, the parser. I have a lot of affection for parser interfaces. The first PC I used had one. Um, the first adventure games I played were also Sierra adventure games, and they used them as well. I don't disagree with the argument that they're an inefficient way of interacting with the computer, but I don't think that they're ineffective. They leave just this sense of possibility. So there's an, an open mystery, an unstated set of parameters. We know the broad guidelines of how we can interact, um, but the specifics are not all known. The downsides of this are taking a loss to the accessibility of the, the, the program that you've created um, to certain people. They're not going to be able to interact with it in the way that you would hope. On the positive side, it does encourage the user, the player in this instance, to explore and experiment with the parser in a way similar to how they're interacting with the environment in this game. The means of interaction is the experience of the world. And as frustrating as it can be to be able to intuit quite easily what action one needs to take, but not the phrase needed to communicate that to the game. That idiosyntactic quality offers its own form of adventure and specific character, which also enhances the sense of an integrated world and an other world. Here we can see this screen has been very carefully composed to accommodate multiple variations. There's Jen, Jen and Kira, um, Jen sitting alone, Jen and Kira sitting, um, and then also Jen and Kira facing the Chamberlain. It's got a lot to do in all circumstances, and the only negative space that draws attention to itself is the initially blank wall. I should address briefly my treatment of the game as a person let's playing it for an audience. I have treated it in a certain way to try and make it more entertaining an experience. So for example, adding uh, soundtracks behind uh, each of the streams and I've, I've added a, a soundtrack to this debrief video as well. That just for one example materially alters the experience and how you might be per perceiving it. It's kind of a, um, a dual experience for, for me as the person let's play because I'm uh, performing the game alive in some circumstances and, and others interacting with it more as I would just for myself. So in summary I'd, I'd say I had a, had a really lovely time um, with this experience. I don't know if I would give it credit for being a great game but it's a, it's a wonderful um, piece of interactive art. It makes a great case for the illustrated adventure game that exists in this period of time because it is using its visual layers to do a lot of storytelling. It does deliver, for, for me at least, a, a consistent sense of wonder and discovery. I love how there are small alternatives to certain problems. Moon Daughter, yes, you could have only have found at the time in-game or in a guidebook like Wits Notes. But the Crystal Bat you can try to avoid, and the Gartham you can sometimes run away from. You don't necessarily need to have found the pebbles or the sling, or the pouch with the fire seeds in. And just like the film on which it's based, I leave the game with a sense of a of a new and different world having been visited, a journey through it inside my imagination. And that's something I'm carrying with me, which is a fine thing for any work of art to have achieved. 
thank you for joining me once again on Thra. And until next time, take care. Bye bye.